So uh, next up, we have uh, Mariana Yalalis, who's talking about uh, coccolithophore calcification. So let me just pull up the slides, and we'll be ready to go. OK, take it away. Um, good day, everyone. I'm Mariana Yalalis, and I'll present the work done during my master's by research at the University of Edinburgh, where we wondered what triggered coccolithophore calcification. So coccolithophores are single cell haptophyta algae that are characterized by being covered in calcite plates. They are tiny, up to 100 micrometers, but still vary greatly in morphology and size, as we can see on the left. Um, while haptophytes have a long history of naked, um, of, of, of non-calcifying phytoplankton of hundreds of millions of years, coccolithophores are believed to start to calcify at some point in the late Triassic. At the same time, um, where the, the first fossils are being found, and when others biomineralized microorganisms also appear, um, appeared or radiated, establishing what today is known as the pelagic carbonate factory. So, coccolithophores, since their appearance, have greatly influenced our world's ecosystems and climates, taking carbon from the atmosphere and incorporating it into the trophic change, but also sequestering it for millions of years, incorporating it into the geological record um, uh, upon dying and sinking. Yet, we don't know what triggered it. We don't know why they start to calcify when they do. So, we hypothesize that um, coccolithophore myomineralization was triggered by an increase of oxygen in the upper ocean in the late, during the late Triassic. This because oxygen has been linked to moments of ecological innovation and evolutionary change, but also because the high metabolic cost of building a calcite um, skeleton. So to test this, we use a relatively novel paleoredox uh, proxy, which is called iodine over calcium, where only the oxidized form of iodine is incorporated into the um, into the carbonate sediments. So higher iodine over calcium ratios are indicative of well oxygenated conditions. If we look at the Lua 2018 record with, for the uh, Proterozoic and Phanerozoic, we see how uh, poorly oxygenated waters with a shallow oxycline transition into modern like well oxygenated conditions during the Mesozoic. But the, um, the resolution for the Triassic was very low, so we looked at carbonates from this period to better understand that transition. Um, and we used samples from the United Arab Emirates, uh, the Musandam Peninsula, and from Austria, uh, from the northern calcareous Alps, right, on Austria. And um, what we saw was that um, staggering difference in the iodine over calcium values here on the left from the when you compare the lower Triassic with the upper Triassic. So very poorly oxygenated uh, waters give rise to uh, a much better oxygenated environment in the upper Triassic. And uh, it's, it's, um, I have to mention that the samples from the upper Triassic that we used are the exact same samples where the oldest coccolites are being found. And or well oxygenated conditions, the high iodine over calcium values are preceding the apparition of coccolites, supporting the idea of oxygen as an environmental trigger. We, we also compared this, uh, this data with um, other redox sensitive trace elements like uranium, so um, that also told a consistent story. So uranium um, reduced form is insoluble, so it becomes uh, it becomes enriched in sediments under anoxic conditions. And as we can see in the record here at the middle of the slide, the um, the the lower Triassic samples have low iodine over calcium and high uranium compared to the upper Triassic, where it's supposedly higher um, well oxygenated conditions started. So above me, you can see this graphical abstract where I wanted to show how um, in the early Triassic, a shallow oxycline led to um, limits the amount of, of available oxygen, right? Um, uh, leading to low iodine over calcium uh, ratio in the carbons. And in contrast, the deeper oxycline in the late Triassic um, 
uh, indicates higher, better oxygenated conditions, the more oxygen is available, that not only was recorded in the carbonates as higher iodine over calcium ratios, but might have also unlocked the energetic constraints of calcification, leading, triggering the emergence of coccolithophores. Thank you very much for your attention. Brilliant. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so next up, we have uh, Felmke Halwerda, who's going to be talking about uh, dental microware in Mosasaurs. So I'll just pull up your slides. So there you go. Take it away. And remember, to, uh, if you have any burning questions, please put them in the chat and we'll get to them in the, uh, the session at the end. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Good morning uh, from this side of the pond and good afternoon for everybody in Europe. Uh, I'm Femke Horda. I'm the Dr. Betsy Nichols Postdoctoral Research Fellow at the Royal Terrell Museum of Paleontology. And I'm doing a postdoc here on local mosasaur feeding ecology. So local sediment dates uh, to the Campanian, about 75 million years old. And 75 million years ago, here we were flooded with the Western Interior Seaway, which ran from uh, North America to um, about the Caribbean. Um, bathymetry is not too deep here, um, but nevertheless, we only find three, uh, maybe four mosasaur types here, which are large mosasaurus misuriensis, which is by far the most common type. Um, also large prognathodon overtoni and slightly smaller Plautopathocarpus primavis and one or two tylosaurs, but they're unfortunately not well preserved. So I wanted to know what is their feeding ecology? Um, is there any niche partitioning here or is there more overlap? So uh, I decided to look at microware and here are my preliminary results. I divided microware into small scratches, large scratches or gouges and pits. So small scratches in 2D microware are indicative of soft food items. Um, large scratches and pits are indicative of hard food items. So I basically reconstructed a sort of Masara triangle uh, of the Masara paper of 1987, um, looking at both the tooth morphology of the animals and their microware, which you see to the left. And let's start with Mosasaurus. Um, it has more or less a generic amount of microware. I say generic because Mosasaurus is known to be a bit of a generalist in terms of their feeding ecology. And I think this is what we see here as well. Their teeth are not blunt, but they're also not very piercing. And they have so far um, a large amount of scratches, but also some pits, also some gouges. So indicating probably they ate a little bit of everything. And as I said, they are the most common type here. Um, and I think that's probably also because of this generalist lifestyle um, indicated by the microware as well. Uh, that's just a very easy way to get around um, in the marine fauna here. So uh, look to the left, there's prognathodon, which has slightly more blunt teeth. Um, actually, What's so nice about the mosasaurs here is that they're very well preserved, their fossils. We have complete skulls and also complete skeletons and sometimes even a little bit of soft tissue preservation. And one of the prognathodons here in the collections has turtle remains in its stomach. And I think it, that matches well with its microware. You can see a lot of pits there uh, indicative of um, dealing with hard food items and hard prey items. So last but not least, um, the smaller platycarpus. Um, its teeth are very similar to those of piscivorous animals we see today. Um, so the idea is that it was piscivorous mostly. And you do see a lot of small scratches in its microware, but I also found a lot of pits indicating some harder food items. And now this is interesting because we see a similar pattern with type Maastrichtian carpets from the Netherlands. They actually have a lot more rough microware than you'd expect. So I think it's probably, it could still be prescivorous, but maybe also it's eating ammonites, belemnites, some fish with harder scales perhaps. So that's an interesting trend. What's also nice about um, the most source here having these complete skulls is that I can look at the entire tooth row. I don't have to look at just isolated teeth. 
So I did that for uh, Mosasaurus and Cognathodon. I looked at the entire tooth row and the progression of microwear along their tooth row. So let's look at Mosasaurus um, at the top. So the premaxilla actually shows a lot of scratches and pits. The maxilla as well. And then the dentary actually shows fewer scratches and more gouges. So I think there might be something happening there with um, how they were using their upper and lower jaws in feeding. Prognacidon also has some dramatic differences between the maxilla, the premaxilla and the dentary. The maxilla shows scratches and the premaxilla mostly pits and the dentary again a little bit more gouges. So again I think it's been employing its upper and lower jaw in a different way. And most of skulls are pretty kinetic, so this will be a nice study for further analysis to look at how exactly did they employ those skulls. Now, as I started my postdoc um, right at the beginning of the pandemic, this is all preliminary, so I have a lot of ideas to how to take this further. Um, as some of you will know, 2D microware is more and more replaced by 3D microware texture analysis which is looking at the entire topology of the wear facet surface and not just imagine a satellite image in the 2D and imagine more an, a cross scan of that in the 3D. So that's the next step for this. Um, it is a bit more costly and a bit more uh, complex to get, but the results are very complementary to the 2D analysis. So that will be very interesting. Another thing I will be doing in the next year is isotope analysis, because it's good to use a multi-proxy approach to get the feeding ecology right. And what is really nice, I think, is I got to uh, hand in a Christmas wish list of which skulls I would like to see prepared in the next year. Um, amongst those, we have a Pliopletocarpus skull. Um, those are quite rare, so that will be really nice to do the entire tooth row of the Pliopletocarpus, as well as the Mosasaurus and Prognathodon. So that is what I have so far. Uh, thank you for listening, and happy to discuss. OK, thank you very much. So we'll, uh, we'll move on to the, the final talk of the of the session. So that's uh, Rachel Superint, who's talking about uh, Phoenicia from the Ediacaran of South Australia. So there you go, take it away. Oh, sorry, we can't, uh, we can't hear you. Got it, sorry. Um, okay, there we go. Yeah. Okay. yeah, so good afternoon, everyone, or morning for me, because I'm joining you from the University of California, Riverside, to present the work I've been doing on Phoenicia Dorothea as a part of the Drozier Lab. Um, but before I get into it, I would like to first acknowledge that the South Australia Ediacara Fossil Site lies within the Andamantla traditional lands. And I would also like to thank the current landowners, Ross and Jane Farger, as well as my funding sources and colleagues who have facilitated this fieldwork throughout the years. <clears throat> so the focus of this presentation is, of course, Phoenicia dorothea, which is a member of the Ediacara biota, a group of organisms that you can see depicted in figure A at the top left. Um, and these are, you know, known for being the first complex community, community forming organisms on Earth. Now, because the majority of the Ediacaran organisms, including Phoenicia, are soft bodied, their features and evolutionary significance are often shrouded by taponomic complexity. Therefore, taxon specific taponomic studies, such as the one at hand, provide key information for the development of an accurate picture of Ediacaran ecosystems. All data discussed here were collected at the Nilpena Station Ediacara Fossil Site in South Australia, the location of which is illustrated in figure B, denoted by the yellow star. And it's important to note, uh, before I get really into it, that all the fossils discussed here are preserved on the basis of bedding planes because the fossil beds represent the smothering of living communities by storm events. Seven such bedding planes at Nilpena are dominated by Phoenicia, an example of which is shown for you in figure C. Uh, which has resulted in a data set of 1,323 distinct Phoenicia fossils that were used for this taphonomic analysis. Um, and Phoenicia is an elongate organism composed of serially repeating modules that extended up into the water column, as shown in the top left of figure D. And it is a unique for, number of, for a number of reasons, namely that it is the most abundant organism in the Ediac remember and occurs solely in densely packed populations that can cover entire bedding plains. 
um, which is a characteristic that is shared by only a handful of Ediacaran taxa globally. Additionally, in contrast to most Ediacaran organisms, which are only preserved in one mode, Phoenicia is one of few taxa that exhibits four preservational modes. These are illustrated from left to right in figure D. And the most common of these modes is the positive relief external mold, uh, which reflects the tendency of Phoenicia to collapse upon burial. And notably, the negative relief external molds, uh, which reflect the burial of Phoenicia without collapse, indicate that when Phoenicia was fluid filled, it was a resistant structure, suggesting that Phoenicia derived its structural integrity and buoyancy, at least in part, from internal fluid. However, it is apparent that only part of Phoenicia's structural integrity is derived from the retention of fluid, because we also observe a pattern of successive feature loss and positive relief external molds of Phoenicia. This is illustrated for you in the left-hand column here. This feature loss that occurs after collapse can be organized into a sequence of four biostratonomic grades that are repeating and predictable, first recording the loss of module definition, followed by the loss of overall integument definition. The retention of modularity in biostratonomic grades one and two, uh, that loss of fluid, show that loss of fluid is not synonymous with feature loss. Instead, the structure of external features was probably derived from a relatively resistant integument, which after collapse was subject to some other form of non-fluid related taphonomic degradation. In order to identify the drivers of this taphonomic degradation, the relative abundances of each taphonomic grade were collected from the seven Phoenicia dominated bedding planes and were then placed on a ternary taphogram shown right above me. Um, and from this, it is clear uh, that Phoenicia preservation varies widely between bedding planes. There are, however, multiple smaller groupings of bedding planes with similar preservation of Phoenicia that suggest preservational variation is not entirely random. The five clusters that I have highlighted in this plot represent taphonomically similar Phoenicia populations. And each cluster is characterized by one of three taphonomic factors that were identified using ethological and sedimentological data independent of Phoenicia taphonomy. The factor that is associated with the most taphonomically distinct population of Phoenicia is time averaging, denoted in red, which corresponds to the extent of Phoenicia decay and leads to the most feature loss in Phoenicia populations, as one would expect. In addition, we see that facies association broadly corresponds with clusters of beds denoted by the orange and blue ellipses showing that higher energy facies correspond with lower detail preservation. However, preservational spread within the lower energy facies is too broad to be defined solely by energy levels. This suggests that the taphonomic impact of energy regimes was overridden by another factor. This factor is the ecological structure of Phoenicia populations, which appears to, to override facies association, as we see one high energy association population plotting in the well-preserved green ellipse distinct from the high energy blue ellipse because this population is characterized by low overlap, overlap ecological structuring. And for more detail on this work, you can access the associated paper at this QR code. Um, and thank you for listening. That's all I have for you. OK, uh, brilliant. Thank you very much. So I'll just uh, stop the slide. So if all of the speakers could please turn their cameras and microphones back on. Uh, then we'll get to some of the questions. And if anybody else has uh, some further questions, then don't hesitate to, uh, to type away in the chat. So I guess we'll we'll start at the beginning. So we have a, a, a question for Wade from Demagraj Dankin, asking if there are any isolated small skeletal fossils in the margin formation. Uh, as far as I know, no. Um, I think uh, about 45% of the specimens from the margin are soft-bodied, and the other are articulated specimens. Okay, brilliant. Uh, and we'll move on next to trilobites. So Rachel Warnock says, very nice. How do you go about uh, reconstructing your hypotheses about trilobite development? Oh, that's a good question. I'm not, I'm not specifically sure what they're asking about, but reconstructing hypotheses about trilobite development. I'm not sure how to answer that. Uh, is, if Rachel's still in the... Uh, oh, yes, please. In the chat, then she, maybe she she could uh, uh, ask exactly what she's uh, what she's asking about for that for the specific. Side of the they may be like looking like asking about trilobite ontogeny, in which we can look at some maybe like the ontogeny morphology changes in a coordinated way. So we look at maybe co variations there. But in our sample, we're only looking at a adult trilobite, like morphologically mature trilobites, and even there, we remove on, like allometry by using the residual stromal regression. So maybe okay. that, but we're not looking yeah, at it. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Thanks. Um, 
Okay, so uh, we have a question for uh, for Mariana. Uh, so uh, Marie Beatrice Farrell asks, can you couple your analysis with calcification events in benthic organisms as well? Well, yes, that's a, that's a very good question. And actually, this, the appearance of cacolotophores happens at the same time where the Mesozoic marine revolution, as, as Verme had presented it. It's a time where you, we see a huge change and, and increase in complexity and morphologies of benthic, um, of benthic fauna. This is uh, I mean, the emergence of cacolotophores, fauna marinifera, and, and the appearance of 50% of taxa radiolarian. Everything happens in the Triassic very early Jurassic. So um, yeah, for sure they are they are related. I haven't looked at uh, numbers or, or data specific, but if you look at the literature, these uh, these processes are, are thought to be linked. Like it's at the, the base of the the chain that might have um, allowed for all this uh, revolution in Bacon Phagma to occur. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Okay, so Femke, we have a, a question for you from Emmanuel Shop, who asks if there is any info on tooth replacement rates in mosasaurs. Yes, that's a good question. Uh, I've been thinking about it. I don't think there's uh, real numbers on that. I mean, if you look at the skull, you see that they did replace them quite fast. You see lots of big teeth and then smaller teeth already erupting and um, because they lose their teeth quite often as well. So, but I don't think anybody really studied uh, to my knowledge, study the precise tooth replacement rate. So, good question. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> okay. So, Rachel, we have a we have a question from uh, from Paul Struther for you. So, uh, he asks, uh, do you find any overlap between your grade four and Diplocriterion? Um. No, I haven't even thought about it in this context. Um, yeah, my short answer is no. I'm not super familiar. Um, Okay, brilliant, thanks. Okay, so, uh, so wait, uh, we have another question for you from uh, from Richard Howard who asks, uh, do you have any any proboscis material or posterior hooks? Uh, yeah, I assume you're asking about my Peleus glacid specimens, not um, the reattributed Atoya specimen, but with our two Peleus glacid specimens, no, there's no uh, posterior hooks or proboscis material. They're kind of poorly preserved in that aspect. Okay, brilliant. Uh, so we have a, another question for uh, from Mariana from um, Joseph Fran uh, Flannery Sutherland, who says, great talk. Do you have any data covering the Carney and, and early Norian given the magnitude of environmental and ecological change at this time? Uh, both successions include well-constrained uh, successions of these ages. Oh, I think we've lost your audio, Mariana. Um, Oh, sorry, sorry, very yeah, quick. Yes, I was, I was sorry. I was supposed to get samples from this period from both Oman and uh, Austria, actually covering the entire Middle Triassic. That was the original plan, but uh, due to the pandemic, they, they never arrived. And then um, the labs were closed and everybody knows, I think what happened, it was, I mean, unfortunate, but um, I'm hoping when I come back to uh, the University of Edinburgh for PhD, I can actually complete this record and we have a better idea of what was happening. Okay, brilliant. So I think Rachel has just got uh, just got back to Ernesto about the uh, about the trilobites. So uh, Rachel says, hey, Ernesto, sorry, I wasn't clearer. Uh, you displayed a plot that I think about it, 10 or so uh, uh, hypotheses. And I just wondered from a non-expert perspective in what ways they differ and how you construct these models. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. And I also think I understood your question more now that I thought about it. So uh, the trilobite glabella expresses this segmentation, and uh, it differs by trilobites. Uh, like you'll see some trilobites that are very effaced and kind of don't express the segmentation a lot, but there's some that do that help these furrows. And we think that the head is composed of few segments. So each furrow would each like little lobe divided by furrows would correspond to these segments, and we kind of we're getting more modules by dividing the trilobite up more. But we don't really have an idea of like, if these really, if these lobes really correspond to like different like underlying segmentation because we're using data and we're not really getting an idea of how many modules there are on the trilobite. So we're probably gonna have to use more 3D methods and we'll get some more data to analyze. Thank you. Okay, brilliant. Um, so Femke, we have a, another question for you from Dima Graj Dankin, who asks uh, if you have any idea on the lifespan of Mosasaurs. Again, that's a really good question. Um, I'm not sure because Mosasaur ontogeny is not that well studied. 
Um, there are like younger specimens and older specimens, but I don't think anybody's really done any histology or looked at the exact lifespan of them. So again, really good question, and I'm afraid I can't answer it specifically. Okay, and then uh, we have another question for Rachel uh, from Dima, uh, who asks, uh, what makes you think Funisia was standing upright in life as opposed to having a reclined life habit? Um, good question. So there are like several lines of evidence. First of all, something I didn't have a question is we have old baths that are preserved associated with the nuclear indicator. Um, additionally, um, our majority of the things we get current alignment and like down and they're overlapping over each other. Um, so there's really no way they can. And uh, returning to the drill uh, holes. Um, okay, fantastic. So um, that brings us pretty much to time. So I'd like to thank our speakers again for the, their really interesting talks, uh, as well as uh, keeping everything on schedule. So that was great. Uh, and thanks everybody who came along and asked some really interesting questions as well. So yeah, brilliant. Thanks again. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.